I, I, I can just hear it right now. Oh man, this, this verse sounds like evil white Christian nationalism. We can't have that, you racist, bigot, xenophobe. That's not fair to the Canaanites. Where is the equality? One nation cannot be blessed more than another. We need multiculturalism, diversity. How dare you say that your nation is a blessing to the world? Damn your white privilege. This is white supremacy. You know, And um, that's what we're faced with today. These angry mobs of people that are jealous or envious of the blessings that God has blessed us with. And it's not because of our race. It's not because we are superior, intelligent white people. It's because we have and we hold on to the birthright that was given to Abraham. Well, all right. The topic of our study today will be enduring hardship and adversity, Genesis chapter 26. And in this chapter, we're going to see God bring Isaac through some trials to uh, toughen him up, strengthen his faith, and help him not become a weak, effeminate man. Okay, And that we're obviously dealing with that in America today. Too many weak, effeminate men uh, not conditioned for adversity. You could think of this chapter as Isaac's initiation period or basic training as he becomes the new birthright holder and inheritor of the promises given to Abraham. Okay, in other words, he was God's man. He was God's representative on earth, the representative of God's kingdom. And God had to get him ready for this important duty. Uh, we're also going to see, once again, see many parallels between the promises given to Abraham that are going to be transferred on to Isaac um, and America. America possesses, and uh, or a lot of these things are a type of what we go through today in America and what our founding fathers went through as well. There are also some great personal lessons for us in this chapter as we sometimes go through hardship and adversity in our own lives. Uh, there are lessons that can help us, uh, lessons in this chapter that will help us go through those periods and understand that sometimes these periods are meant to help us uh, become stronger and more able servants of God. And, um, and one thing we're going to see is that hardships are not always a bad thing. You know, whether we're talking about economic adversity uh, or economic hardships, um, you know, death of family members, you name it, any kind of hardships, they're not always a bad thing, even though we, we don't like them. They, they hurt. They don't feel good. But in the end, sometimes God is building us up for something greater, okay? For something greater. Genesis 26, verse 1, And there was a famine in the land... Besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham, and Isaac went unto Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. Okay, there was a famine in the land here. Now Isaac was faced, Isaac right off the bat in the beginning of this chapter, he's faced with uh, a serious event here. You know, what's he going to do? It looks like there hadn't been one like this famine for about a hundred years. Uh, the last one was during Abraham's lifetime, and you can find that written about in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. So, right off the bat, Isaac is faced with hard times, okay? Hard times. And this Abimelech guy, uh, this just appears to be a title given to these Philistine kings back then. Abraham dealt with another Abimelech, if you can remember, several chapters ago. Um, and this, this man called Abimelech here is likely the uh, son or the grandson of the Abimelech of Abraham's time. All right, then and this, uh, one more point on here. He goes to Gerar. Now, Gerar means a lodging place. Um, and no doubt it's named this for a reason because Abraham or Isaac at this time what didn't actually possess the promised land. He was a traveler, a sojourner. Now I'm going to say this word and I want you to lock it in your mind. He was a pilgrim in the land that was promised to him. We hear of the American pilgrims. Well, there's definitely a correlation here as we're going to see. Um, all right, watch what happens now. Verse 2, And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt. Dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Now, notice he says, go not down to Egypt. This is interesting because during the, the other great famine, about 100 years ago, Abraham was allowed to go down to Egypt. But now God comes to Isaac and says, do not go down 
to Egypt. Okay? Um, but why, why Egypt? Why would Isaac want to go down to Egypt like Abraham did? Well, there was the Nile River there that was a constant, even in times of uh, famine, the Nile River still kept flowing and it was a constant source of water. To, for the crops, for your, your herds, your cattle, you name it. It was always there, whether, uh, rather, whether it was famine or rain, the Nile still provided that source of comfort. Now you think about it, and that Nile River, Egypt, is a source of, uh, or is a type of anything in our life that's a source of comfort that we always try to fall back on instead of facing adversity. We want to find that place of comfort. Um, all right, but in the, in the land of Canaan, you were almost completely dependent upon rain. There was no such thing as the Nile. There were other rivers and stuff, but they didn't irrigate the land like the Nile did. So you were, if, the, if there was no rain, it meant no water for your crops or for your animals. So this doesn't look good for, for Isaac, but yet God tells him, in the beginning of a famine, to stay there and endure it. I could imagine, uh, you know, some people we could doubt today. We could say, well, I don't know if I'm going to trust God in this, man. This is not looking good. I got to get out of here. I got to go find some security somewhere other than what God is telling me to do. Okay? And it's easy to think like that, but he obeyed, as we're going to see here. Verse 3. Sojourn in this land. Don't go down to Egypt. Sojourn in this land and I will be with thee and, and will bless thee. Now check this out. For unto thee and unto thy seed, that's his biological family line, I will give all these countries and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. Now, God didn't just tell Isaac to stay here without reassuring him first that he would be with him. Today we've got we go through all kinds of different problems, trials, tribulations, sickness, disease, you name it. But we've been given promises of his reassurance that in the end it will work out for us. We will receive the inheritance. We will get the blessing. Um, and uh, and in this case, God actually said he would bless. Isaac in the midst of a famine. That's, that's almost unheard of. Now check this out. For unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries. Um, did I? Oh, no. That's not part of the verse. I'm just, that's a... Uh, all right. That was one of my... I got confused by my note there. Sorry about that. But that's a part of the verse there. For unto thee and thy seed will I give all these countries. What is that? You know, let's, let's stop for a minute. God is Now, check out what God is saying here. I am going to take this land away from the Canaanites, from this ethnic group, and I'm going to give it to another ethnic group, being ultimately being the Israelites. Um, and, you know, that, that's, that sounds pretty harsh by today's standards. Is that, you know, people would be crying out, that's not equality, that's not fair, that's racism. You're going to take it from that ethnic group and, get, and that's ethnic cleansing, they could even say, you know, and they, and they try to um, judge God for that. Uh, well, you know what, this sounds very similar to what happened in America's founding. Our pilgrims came here, they didn't possess the land yet, the Indians um, possessed land. I got another story for that another time. I went on a vacation down in Mexico one time. And the, one of the guides down there, and I had just learned that many people thought the, the Indians that were in America were actually the same biological descendants of the Canaanites in the Bible. And it was fascinating because this guy was an Indian guy, and he said that his ancestors were the Canaanites. So he obviously studied the, the, and believed uh, that uh, that aspect. So you almost see a totally with the with America. You almost see a total replay of what Isaac is going through here. So you think of Isaac. You know the the uh, the pilgrims when they came here on the Mayflower. They faced famines. They faced adversities. It was not easy. this. It was a struggle to build this country. And they went through it and look at where we are now. I mean now we're faced with other problems, but look at what happened. Because of their faith and dedication to God, it grew into a great, mighty nation. Um, just as God promised Isaac, he says, I'm going to give you all these countries. Now, who are we, you know, who are we to question God that that wasn't fair to the Canaanites? Uh, are, we, are we the righteous judge and God is not? 
And that's the way people treat God today. And I, I believe that is even a source of a lot of America's problems today is because people uh, blame America's founding fathers um, for all of the problems. And they, they, they say it's a, the, it's a racial thing. Well, what do you think the Canaanites probably thought? They probably thought it was a racial thing back then. It's not fair that Isaac was chosen and we're not. Okay? Um, I'm going to leave that one up for God. It's, uh, uh, but we, we always try to put it in, in, uh, in um, we always try to frame everything according to what we believe is right rather than what the Bible says is right, what God says is right. Um, now you, you look out there and it's, uh, you know, they, they say it's the evil white men that built this nation. And, it, and, and what's interesting about this is this nation is now the envy of the world. And people are coming here from other countries that don't like, even like our founding fathers. They come here and, they, and they, they hate our culture and our heritage. But we must ask ourselves, but why do they still want to come here? If they, if, what's the purpose? And I'll tell you what the purpose is. They're not coming here because they, they love America or what it stands for or what made America great. They're coming here because of our blessings. They're coming here because of material. Uh, uh, in many cases, there are some legitimate people that want to come here that, that want to assimilate and love our culture and think this is a great country. But a lot of them just come here because they want to suck the materials, the material blessings of America. And Joel chapter 2 talks about this, how that foreigners would one day come to America like, the, like armies of locusts with one specific purpose, to strip bare, eat up, and devour the nation's produce and its blessings. They don't come here to, to, to um, help build up that culture, that culture that produces fruit, that obedience to God, that brings all these blessings. No, they come to take, to strip and to take. Okay? Verse 4, And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and I will give unto thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. That sounds like racial superiority to me, doesn't it? Um, because you know, speaking of racial, it's the line, the family line that came through Isaac. Okay, we know it's the, the, it really isn't based off of race because Esau was of the same line of uh, of um, Jacob, but Jacob was chosen and Esau wasn't. So it's not totally based on that. But nevertheless, what we see here is a seed, a biological family that all the earth would be blessed by. Um, and I see the same thing that happened. Uh, you know, you, you look at 2,000 years of Christian history. You see that, um, you see that uh, Christianity followed primarily a certain group of people. And that was the, the, you know, the Caucasians, the Anglo-Saxons, you name it. That's where Christianity, uh, that, that's where the hub of Christianity was. And should we apologize for that? Is that a bad thing? Well, if we have to apologize for that and think that that was bad or, or not equal or it's not you know, part of equality, then we'd have to say that this was very evil for God to choose Isaac to set him above all nations of the earth to be a blessing unto them. That means that whatever Isaac had was superior to the other nations because he had the truth. He had the laws of God, the morality of God, and God blessed him with the abilities to, to further his work here on earth. Now, I, I could just hear it right now. Oh, man, this, this verse sounds like evil white Christian nationalism. We can't have that, you racist, bigot, xenophobe. That's not fair to the Canaanites. Where is the equality? One nation cannot be blessed more than another. We need multiculturalism, diversity. How dare you say that your nation is a blessing to the world? Damn your white privilege. This is white supremacy. You know, And um, that's what we're faced with today. These angry mobs of people that are jealous or envious of the blessings that God has blessed us with. And it's not because of our race. It's not because we are superior, intelligent white people. It's because we have... And we hold on to the birthright that was given to Abraham. 
Uh, we have the, 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 we've built our nation upon the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, I know this must sound just totally foreign. I mean, if I gave this lecture in a church today, they'd run me out. Well, they'd run Jesus out today, too, if he was in there, too. Because all I'm doing is reading his word and defending what he says instead of apologizing for it. Um, now, in the New Testament, the kingdom of God, yes, is a little bit less of a biological thing or a racial thing, right? In Galatians chapter 3, verse 11 says, For there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is in all and uh, Christ is all and in all. In other words, salvation in the New Testament was opened up to all of the nations of the world, regardless of what race you are, the color of your skin, it doesn't matter, okay? Um, and Jesus even said to the apostles or disciples in Matthew 28, verse 19, he said that uh, they were to go, for, go therefore and teach all nations, make disciples of all peoples. Okay, So in that sense, um, Christian nationalism or whatever you want to call it, uh, it you know, Christianity, in other, I'll put it this way, Christianity is an inclusive religion. It doesn't, um, what do you call it, uh, discriminate against people based off of their color. That would be wrong. But what also is an inescapable truth is that God chose Israel to be the hub of where Christianity would come from. Remember, Isaac was to be a blessing unto all, all nations. Well, we saw that throughout Europe. Um, why didn't Asia become totally Christian? Why didn't Africa? Why didn't uh, you know, other parts of the world become Christian? It's because they were not the chosen nations of God. Why did Europe become uh, the, the foundation of where Christianity spread? It's because, no doubt, they were the true children of Abraham through Isaac. You know, it's funny, Isaac actually means, uh, well, it means the children of laughter, but the word Anglo-Saxon, where many of us have descendants that came from those Anglo-Saxon countries, means the sons of Isaac. And here we're talking about this blessing. There's, there's no doubt that this can't be, I mean, um, this can't be an accident that the, the birthright and the blessings of Abraham uh, came into Europe and stayed there and, and came all the way here to America with the same, primarily the same group of people. Now, that's not to say that uh, other nations, again, that other nations aren't welcome in. We see that in Revelation chapter 22, I think it is, New Jerusalem. You've got uh, the 12 gates with, uh, I think there was, I'm trying to remember if there was the walls or the gates. But anyways, the, 12, the names of the 12 gates tribes of the children of Israel were around that city. So it's very, Israel is still very much uh, a part of God's plan, that nation. It is the hub, if you would, of the gospel. Uh, uh, so, well, Jesus said it in many other ways. He said, you are the light of the world, a city upon a hill. And when he was given that lecture, he wasn't talking to Gentiles at that time, believe it or not. Matthew chapter 5 was given to Israelites that were sitting there at, the, at his feet listening to that sermon. Um, um, you know, and this is why, and, and, I, I, and this, this lecture must just sound crazy to some people, but this is why many people refer to Christianity as the white man's religion. Because, and it's why some people reject it. And they're rejecting it based off of their pride of race. What they're saying is, well, let's just, there's this black Israelite movement. They, they say that Christianity was a white man's religion and they try to say they're the true Israelites and yet they don't even believe anything about Christianity. But in other words, they, they reject Christianity and they get people to not want to be a part of Christianity because they say that it came from the white man. And that Jesus, since Jesus was a white man, we can't follow that religion. Well, who's the one with the racial pride then? Is it the people that were chosen by God to be a servant to the other nations? Or the people that say, it's not fair, uh, it's not fair, that should be for me. Okay? You know, when you, when you look at it from that aspect, you know, I'll say this too, there are also uh, people of Caucasian origin or Israelite origin that... Uh, would get prideful because of this. And Jesus addressed those types of people in John chapter 8. Um, well, first, the, uh, John the Baptist did. He said, 
to these people that boasted to be of Abraham's seed, he said, God can raise up stones to become children of Abraham. In other words, it's not your racial superiority that's giving you these things. You inherited something, and we're going to talk about it. You inherited a, birth, a special birthright, but it's not because you're so great. It's because of the... Uh, the purposes and the plans of God, okay? So you can definitely take this message the wrong way and then think that since you're a white person, you're great and you're powerful and superior. That's not at all what, what the scripture is saying. Um, anyways, all right. I'll say, I'll, I'll got a couple more points to make here and then we'll get on to the next scriptures. Uh, just as the tribes of Israel were chosen to carry forth the light of truth to the nations in the Old Testament, no doubt God has, a, has chosen the Caucasian tribes of the world to carry forth the gospel of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. The concept of a chosen nation is not merely an Old Testament thing, as many like to say. It continues on in the New Testament as well. And there are, different, there are many different examples of that. Uh, when Peter was speaking to the Israelites, he said, but you are a chosen generation. This is in 1 Peter chapter 2.9. You don't have to turn there. I'm just going to read one verse here. But you are a chosen generation. That word generation is, means a race of people. You're a chosen race of people. A royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now notice, they were to be a blessing unto the world, to be a priest nation unto the world. They weren't to lord it over other people and say, you can't go to heaven because you're, of, you're not of this racial descent and so forth. Okay, um, They were to be a blessing unto the world. All right. But you can't be a blessing unto the world if you... The point is, we were chosen for this... The Israelites were chosen for this specific purpose. Now, had they apologized for God's calling upon their life and upon their nation, they would not be able to carry forth that, that uh, role as being a priest nation. They would forfeit that role out of guilt, like, oh, I so, feel so guilty that God chose me to do this. It's not fair to the other peoples. You know? And then that's what happens today. Then, then we have this lukewarm Christianity that develops, and then what happens is you got so-called Christians now trying not, uh, to take Christ off the throne over the nations. These so-called Christians against Christian nationalism. They're trying to remove Christ from being the king of the nations. This is a domino effect, if you see. We've seen it happen. Once we start apologizing for who we are, for what our, for what our divine calling is, then we stop doing it because it's not fair, and then, uh, then the whole thing crumbles from there. All right. Um, another example could be Exodus chapter 19. Well, Peter quoted from Exodus 19, verses 5 through 6, where it says, Now therefore, if you obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. Now think about that. This is what the world is against today. Any nation, any people be, being a peculiar or a special people above all nations. Oh, how dare you say, make America great again? What about China? What about all these other countries? Isn't that unfair to them? You know, all these statements are against what God teaches. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and, and now check it out, a holy church. No, he says a holy nation. That holy nation means a separate nation, a nation that is set aside for a specific purpose. Um, all right. And he says, these are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Okay. Exodus 19 verses 5 through 6. So we can't say these things today. Any talk of God having a chosen people appalls many Christians. They call you a racist, a white nationalist, a, a Christian nationalist, and on and on the list goes. Well, what do we do about Isaac then? Well, they're, they're, what they always try to do is they always try to divide the Old Testament from the New Testament. That's the Old Testament. Well, the problem is you're going to find this stuff all throughout the New Testament as well. Revelation chapter 14, verse 1. You can turn there if you want. I'm going to read a few verses from there is one example where God still has a chosen bride of a specific tribe or tribes of people. Revelation 14 verse 1 says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him an hundred and forty and four thousand, having their father's name written in their foreheads. 
Verse 2, And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder, and a voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts, and the elders. Now check this out. And no man could learn that song, but the hundred and forty and four thousand, which were redeemed from the earth. Now where, who are these hundred and forty four thousand? Well we, find, well, we know from Revelation chapter 7 that they were 12,000 from each tribe that were elected for a specific purpose, uh, especially in the last days. So th these were Israelites, is, is the point. These were a specific tribe of people that only they could sing this song. Okay? We do find out in Revelation chapter 7 that there were other huge groups of people before God's throne that were his servants as well, and they were of all the other nations of the world. The point being is God still has a central chosen nation. I believe that nation today is definitely America. And what we see happening in our country today with this vile hatred against uh, our founding fathers, against us, uh, against white people in general, is because Satan knows who we are. And his and he's and he sent his. Well, it said we read it in Revelation 12. The dragon chases the woman. It didn't say the dragon chased this multicultural uh, conglomerate of people. No, he said he chased the woman and her seed. Um. All right. Anyways. Now, now some people say, well, yeah, but Pastor Ben, that was uh, Israel of the Old Testament. Um. And America is not Israel, but what they've never, uh, uh, we could get into this. Whether or not we are the biological descendants of Israel really doesn't matter. I think, it, I, think it, I think we are. But what matters is recognizing where that birthright is. Who has the blessing to become a great nation? Who has the blessing to be the nation that controls the gates of its enemies? I mean, all those blessings of Abraham fit precisely with America. But I, but, but I have no doubt that, uh, well, I think they've just never heard of the Ten Lost Tribes. They've never studied the migrations of how they uh, went into Assyrian and Babylonian captivities, migrated north up over the Caucasus Mountains, were later called Caucasians, and then they spread throughout Europe uh, and were converted to Christianity when the gospel came, and ever since they've been carrying forth that message. All right? All right, verse 5. Well, I better get going because we're... Uh, <laughs> We've got a lot of verses left here, okay? Because that Abraham obeyed my voice. Now check this out. Because, why, did, why, why, did the, why was this family so blessed? Because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Abraham was a Christian nationalist. Damn him for being so uh, evil for this, right? That's what, that's what Christian nationalists want to do. We want to obey God's laws. We want them to be the, um, the center of our culture. And that's why we would be blessed. If we don't want that, hey, we don't, then we don't need to be blessed, okay? So in other words, this isn't, Abraham wasn't chosen by God because he was uh, you know, racially superior to other people. It was because he obeyed. Then the blessing came on his family because of that. Now, why did God, I guess someone could argue, well, then why did God even come to Abraham in the first place? Well, I don't know. That, that, that could be something we could get into some other time. But anyways, verse 6, And Isaac dwelt in Gerar, and the men of that place asked him of his wife, and he said, She is my sister. Sound familiar? He feared to say, She is my wife, lest he said, The men of this place should kill me for Rebekah, because she was fair to look upon. Now, both Abraham and Isaac had, you know, the, the same problem. They had hot wives that, that they were afraid somebody was going to kill them and take them. <laughs> this must have been a really bad problem that they suffered through, you know. But, uh, <laughs> um, and I can't understand why they both kept repeating this lie that their wives were their sisters because in all cases, the, these uh, Philistines at this time, um, or the, uh, yeah, the Philistines, the Canaanites, None of them ever attempted to try to kill them to take their wives. They were actually most of their dealings, at least that we see of, are very friendly. Um, and and uh, so, anyways, it, that, it kind of puzzles me why these men that were given great promises by God would be fearful 
like that. I guess maybe it shows their weakness, that they were still men, that they still feared that bad things could happen to them. Um, all right, here we go. Verse 8. And it came to pass when he had been there a long time that Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, looked out at a window and saw, and behold, Isaac was sporting with Rebekah, his wife. Now, no doubt they must have had a pretty good relationship for him to be showing. They were showing a little public uh, affection here. And, um, and the king of uh, the Philistines caught him, caught him red-handed. He's like, you don't do what Isaac was doing with your sister. That wouldn't be very appropriate. So he knew that uh, something was going on here. And he wasn't going to accuse uh, Isaac of being uh, a, uh, uh, a sinner, in a sense. Because if that was his sister, this would be a pretty bad thing, right? But he, he automatically assumed the better of Isaac, probably knew his reputation. And this is what he says. Verse 9, And Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, of a surety, she is thy wife. In other words, Dude, that's your wife, man. I know it. I, I saw what you were doing there. And how didst thou say, and how, and how saidest thou she is my sister? And Isaac said unto him, Because I said, lest I die for her. Okay? He was afraid that people are going to kill him and take his hot wife from him. And that would be the end of the story. <laughs> Verse 10, And Abimelech said, What is this that thou hast done unto us? One of the people might lightly have lion with thy wife, and she should have said, and thou shouldest have brought guiltiness upon us. Now it's interesting, back in these times, you know, these Canaanites here, this, in this case it was the king of the Philistines, they still had a degree of morality about them. It wasn't until about 400 years later that they became so vile and so wicked that God then displaced them and had the Israelites utterly commanded them to utterly wipe them out and take their land. Here we got this, uh, this guy, um, and it is also interesting, and it, there were actually some American Indians, chiefs, that actually helped our pilgrim forefathers. Um, some helped them during the times of famine, actually helped them uh, learn how to plant crops a certain way to help uh, produce uh, a good, a good uh, harvest and so forth. But anyways, so you see here a good... Uh, this, the point is this guy was... Uh, a Philistine guy, no, we known as a pagan, but he still had a degree of morality. He still thought adultery was evil because he, he knew that if, uh, if, if somebody would have lied with his wife, that God was going to punish them for him. So there was, again, there was a degree of the fear of the Lord in this place, which is good. Verse 11, And Abimelech charged all his people, saying, He that toucheth this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Okay, all right, he's protecting him. Verse 12, Then Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year an hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. Now check that out. It was during a time of famine that Isaac here, it appears to be the same year, the same exact year as the famine came, that Isaac was to sow in the land and he still received a bountiful harvest. What does that say to us? Hey, when, when God's blessings are upon us, even during hard times, God can cause us to flourish. He can cause us to flourish, even during a time of famine. Um, all right. Verse 13, And the man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great. So God's hand was upon him. He was becoming great. And you look, you look at the parallel between um, uh, the American pilgrims and Isaac and his family, and there's striking similarities there. All right, verse 14, For he had possession of flocks and possession of herds and great store of servants and the Philistines. Now check this out. And the Philistines envied him. All right, does that sound, it sound similar? Why did they envy him? Because of his possessions, his blessings, his herds. Why is America the envy of the world today? It's because of our great wealth and possessions. Okay? Um, and... Uh, Unfortunately, that's why many people want to come here. It's not because they want to assimilate into Christian culture. It's because they want the wealth. That's a violation of the commandment. What's that called? That's called uh, um, thou shalt not covet. covet. Yep, thou shalt not covet. Verse 15, For the wells which his, father's, uh, which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham, his father, the Philistines had stopped them and filled them with earth. So the Philistines were jealous of Isaac. So now they're filling up these wells uh, and trying to stop uh, Isaac's success. 
Okay? And they were limited by the king because the king said, hey, if anybody touches this guy, if anybody touches Isaac or his wife, they're going to be put to death. So they were doing everything else they could besides killing him to make life miserable for him. And you look at uh, how, how Christians are treated in America today. It's the same thing. We're persecuted, hindered at every step we take. Verse 16, And Abimelech said unto Isaac, Go from us, for thou art much mightier than we. So Isaac actually and his family, because they were blessed by God, actually be, were, were, became greater than the nation that they were living in. And they weren't even citizens of that country at this time. Um, you look at America. What happened to America when the pilgrims came here? They flourished greatly. They grew. And then what happened? Well, we ended up having the, the we became greater than the Native Americans. Verse 17, And Isaac departed thence and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac digged again the wells of water which they had digged in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. And he called their names after the names by which his father had called them. And Isaac's servants digged in the valley and found there a well of springing water. And the herdmen of Gerar did strive with Isaac's herdmen, saying, The water is ours. And he called the name of the well Essek, because they strove with him. Now, Essek means contention. And I have no doubt it was named this way, so we could see it as a type of today. There's going to, even after God promises you great blessings, you're going to have periods of contention. It's gonna, you're going to start out in a famine where it looks like, Oh, thanks, God. Thanks for sending me here. You know, why am I here? Why am I doing this? And then there's now, not only was he faced with a famine, now he's trying to get water. And you realize water is really important during a time. You don't have water, you're done for, right? Now he's trying to get water in this place that God told him to stay at. And these Philistines keep blocking all of his wells. And he's got to go dig other ones. And he's got to keep moving on. So one thing that was really neat about Isaac is he didn't lay on his back and cry and say, God, you promised me to stay here, and now they're filling up my wells, and I'm, this, this, this sucks, <laughs> you know, and cry about it. Um, he was persevering through trials, through contention, through trials and tribulation, right? We need to persevere as well. We can't be, but that's why I said in the beginning, God is bringing Isaac through this to, to condition him to harden him, to strengthen his faith, and so that he's not a weak, effeminate man. He went out there and he was digging these wells, trying to overcome this adversity. He didn't give up. All right? Verse 21, And they digged another well and strove for that also. And he called the name of it Sitna. Now, Sitna means strife, okay? Contention and strife. Uh, what does Isaac do? Does he give up? Verse 22, And he removed from thence and digged another well, for they that uh, and for that they strove not. And he called the name of it Rehoboth, for he said, For now the Lord hath made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. So finally he was able to dig some wells through his perseverance, and they stopped bothering him. And no doubt God was behind, well, God orchestrated this whole thing. He was trying to, trying to condition Isaac to be, a, be someone who would persevere through trials and tribulation. If you, this guy's going to be the chosen, he's going to be the ancestor of the chosen nation. He's going to be that, uh, that man that passes on this great inheritance. He certainly couldn't be a cowardly man, a weak man, or a quitter. Okay? All right. And Rehoboth means wide places or streets. After you go through the trials and tribulations, God eventually opens the path and his blessings will then fall upon you, right? All right. Um, and he went up, verse 23, and he went up from thence to Beersheba, and the Lord appeared unto him by the, uh, appeared unto him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham, thy father. Now check this out, God did not appear to Isaac during that tribulation period. You know, a lot of us, when we're going through tribulation, we'd still, God, are you still there? Are you still there? It, show me a sign. He waited till he overcame, until, it, till he passed the trial. Then God came back to him. He came to him before, and now he's coming to him afterwards. Um, and the Lord appeared unto him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham, thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee. He was with him the whole time. 
and will bless thee and multiply thy seed. Now check this out. He's going to multiply his family lineage. This is a, if you want to call it a racial thing, that's what it is. For who? For my servants, for my servant Abraham's sake. Okay. Um, you know, all throughout the the Bible, you'll see that you'll see that God actually. It isn't because somebody was a certain race that he would bless them. It isn't because Abraham or Isaac was uh, a European Caucasian type person that, that God blessed him. It, it, I mean, it isn't because of his, his, his uh, DNA, in other words. It's because of, first of all, it's because of what he, he's being blessed because of what his father Abraham did. Now, there are scriptures like Genesis 9 verse 25 that that says, uh, "Curse be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. God can either bless certain races or tribes of people, or he can curse certain races or tribes of people. And it's not because of their race, it's because of what had been done uh, a lot of times by their forefathers, okay? By their forefathers. Um, you find out in... Uh, what is it? Uh, Exodus 34, verse 7. God says, he, he keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. Now check this out. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. So that's what you can look out. You can say, why are certain people seem to be more blessed than others when you look out at the world today? Well, a lot of times it's because of what their fathers passed on to them. They, if they're not passing on to them the truth like Abraham did, their countries aren't going to flourish. They're not going to be blessed. They're going to uh, be cursed. And there's, there's warnings throughout the Bible where God says he's going to visit the iniquity to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Um, but then he also says, I'm going to bless the third and fourth generation or the generations of those that love me. Okay? Verse 25, back to Genesis 26, verse 25. And he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants digged a well. And now check this out. Then Abimelech went to him from Gerar and Ahuzath, one of his friends, and Philcol, the chief captain of his army. And Isaac said unto them, Wherefore come ye to me, seeing ye hate me? And have sent me away from you. So this king that sent him away is now coming to him to talk to him. Okay, the Philistine king. In verse 28, and they said, we, we saw certainly that the Lord was with thee. And we said, lest there be now an oath between, betwixt us, even betwixt us, uh, uh, even betwixt us and thee, and let us make a covenant with thee. So the pagans knew these pagans knew that God was with Isaac. I mean, even today in our lives, you might have non-believers, atheists. And if you're a true Christian, they can oftentimes sense that. There's something different about this person. Whereas they'll look at some of these fake Christians that blabbers in tongues and does all this. They think they're doing all these healings and all this crazy stuff. They, that doesn't really phase them. They, oh, that's a flaky person. But when they see a real Christian, they can sense that somehow, many times. Um, now, what we're going to see here, um, well, I'm going to read verse 29 and I'll explain. That thou wilt do us no hurt, as we have not touched thee, as we have done unto thee nothing but good, and have sent thee away in peace. peace. <laughs> thou art now the blessed of the Lord. And he made them a feast, and they did eat and drink. Um, so they, they had a celebration. This, this godly man, Isaac, is now having a, making a peace agreement with this pagan king, the king of the Philistines, and they're actually enjoying some time together here. Um, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. Even today in our daily lives, we, we sometimes will go have a beer or two with uh, non-believers, have discussions with atheists, you know, or uh, non-believers, but um, they had this understanding they were able to do that. You know, um, one thing we probably, one thing that wasn't done here is we don't see Isaac begging this guy to be a follower of God. And I think that's an example for us today when we go to these secular, uh, what do you call them, secular type settings. We don't have to go there and try to beg people to become a Christian. A lot of times our example of just being a decent person to them uh, will have more of an effect than, than asking them if they love Jesus and if Jesus is in their heart yet. I mean... Um, 
the, and, and what the result of that oftentimes is they, because you're not begging them like a puppy dog, you know, with its tongue out saying, believe in Jesus, believe in Jesus, they'll come and start asking you questions. Or they might, they, might even ask you, they might not even ask you specific questions, but it might cause them to sit and think about it. You know, what is different about that person? Um, you know, but whereas the Jesus freaks, that I guess I, I would call them, uh, would go there and be pushing Jesus on them 24-7. They can't, they can't even go anywhere without somebody saying, oh gosh, there's that guy again. He's going to be trying to push Jesus on me or talk about speaking in tongues or some crazy stuff like that. Um, Anyways, here we go. So there, there's a time, I mean, no, they probably had a couple beers together here. They did, you know, at a feast here. We know during Jesus' time, during feast, there was wine present. So they probably had a couple beers together, t- had small talk with each other, and talked about the famine. And he probably shared, yeah, it was a bad famine. We got through it and all that. Um, they had to be, they, they were associating with each other. So, you know, when we talk about Christian culture being superior to non-Christian culture, there's a way of, you know, there's a place, time and a place to say that. You don't go there and shove it down somebody's face at a barbecue, you know, and uh, or something like that. But when it comes to standing up for it in the, in the public, in the right public arenas, then that's, we need to definitely do that. We don't, in other words, we don't, com- Isaac wasn't compromising the truth to get along with this guy. He wasn't like, well, I'm going to just tell him, I'm going to soften things a little bit so he'll be my buddy and make peace with me. No, he stood where he stood. That guy respected it, knew he was blessed of God, made a peace agreement, and they weren't going to go to war against each other. Uh, Another lesson you can learn from that is don't be a troublemaker. Don't go around trying to cause wars with non-believers. If they come, then they come, but don't be the the, the root cause of it because you just want some excitement or something. Um, Verse 31. And they rose up betimes in the evening, or in the morning, I'm sorry, and swear to one another. And Isaac sent them away, and they departed from him in peace. And it came to pass the same day that Isaac's servants came and told him concerning the well which they digged, and said unto him, We have found water. Okay, now Isaac and his servants were not lazy. They were always proactive. They didn't just sit around and wait for God's promises. They were still working, okay? Verse 33 And he called it Sheba, therefore the name of the city is Beersheba unto this day. Now this is very interesting. Sheba means oath. And no doubt, Isaac named this well the oath because he remembered all the way back up in one of the verses in this chapter that God made an oath with him, with Abraham, and then passed that on to him that he would bless him. Okay, So in other words, He's acknowledging that God fulfilled his promise after he overcame all this adversity. God was with him and blessed him. Now check out how this chapter ends. Verse 34. And Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith of the daughter of Beri, the Hittite, and Bashemeth, the daughter of Elan, the, the Hittite. Okay? These were foreign pagan wives. Okay, no doubt Esau may, might have believed in multiculturalism and diversity. Uh, maybe he really liked the seductive nature of these Hittite women and the, some of the clothes they were wearing, you know, and he couldn't control himself. Who knows? Um, verse 35, which were a grief of mind unto Isaac and to Rebekah. These two pagan women caused a great deal of grief to Esau's parents, Isaac and Rebekah. Now, this, you know, Esau, we talked about it last week, he, dis, he was like the modern-day liberal, despised the birthright, could care less about God's laws, his morality, his standards, uh, his people. He cared less about Abraham's wishes. Um, he would be the type of person today that would say, I feel guilty for being a white person. It's white privilege. And, you know, that, that's your Esau today. Um, somebody who cares less about God and only about the lusts of the flesh. Okay, now this is an interesting lesson could be learned here is just because somebody has Christian parents, it doesn't mean that all of their kids are going to be not a disappointment to them. Now, Isaac and Rebekah were godly parents, but Esau became a great disappointment. Satan, God's son, though God's the best parent anybody could ever have, Satan rebelled against God. So we can't always blame the parents. You know, I've heard people say, well, if all your children, if you got one child that's a rebel, 
then you can't be a pastor of this church because it shows that you cannot contain your own house. You know, there, yeah, if your whole household is wild and crazy and you have no discipline, that's one thing. But you could exercise all the right discipline. You could do everything right as a parent and still have an Esau. Uh, God forbid uh, any of our families have that. But it's, it's a reality. Of ultimately, our children will choose for themselves. Even though they, they've been born and raised in a Christian environment or a family, they're still going to have to face their moments of decision to serve God or be an Esau. All right. And Christian Overcomers is brought to you by the tithes and offerings of our listeners. If you would like to support our ministry, please go to ChristianOvercomers.com. God bless you, and thank you for your support. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible sword. His truth is 